All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, maybe I can get at least, Haran, can you give me a thumbs up to confirm you can hear me? There we go, good, perfect. Just wanted to check. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, very excited to welcome you here today for this first in what we hope will be a uh, significant series of faculty opportunities to share insight and perspective on the impact of COVID-19 on different aspects of the economic system. Um, there'll be more information coming around about that shortly, uh, but we're excited that you're able to be here to join us. Before I start uh, though, I just wanna make sure to, to kind of uh, just say that I hope everyone is safe. I hope everyone is healthy. I hope your family and friends and uh, loved ones are all safe. These are scary times in many ways. Um, I think many times we kind of forget that we're uh, not just locked in our in our living rooms or bedrooms or whatever it might be uh, for no apparent reason, but because of the significant health challenges that the world is facing right now. And we're all trying to do our parts by remaining remote, trying to stop the spread of this disease. If you have any questions, any concerns, any any needs that that I can that, that we in the MBA side can help out with please feel free to reach out to me or anyone else in the MBA programs team at any point in time. Um, that said, uh, we're really excited today to help kick off this series. Um, we're excited to have, uh, uh, well, so let me actually talk about logistics quickly first. Um, we're, this seminar is gonna go for about a half an hour uh, when, once Haran starts. Um, there's the Q&A window that you can use to submit questions. I will then use things submitted in there and, or through the chat to maybe ask some questions after the, 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 the talk is done. So feel free to put any questions you have in there. We won't get to everything, but I'll try and do the best I can to cover many of those questions. You can also use the chat window to share ideas, perspectives, thoughts. If you have questions just for the panelists, which is kind of the people running the session, submit them there, or to everyone, submit panelists and attendees to engage in a more uh, general conversation. Um, please, that's a public good, so please you know, uh, only share things that are really relevant to the conversation we're having here. With that, uh, I'm really excited to have Professor Haran Sigram here today to talk with us about his perspective and background um, on this crisis and on the implications it has for the financial, service, for the financial sector. Uh, Professor Seagram has his PhD in economics from the University of Sydney. He also has a long career in the, as a practitioner in the financial services sector as well, so brings both kind of the academic and the practitioner perspective on this. Uh, I will turn it over to Professor Seagram, and he will be able to take it from here to share with you his perspective. We're thrilled to have you here, though. Thank you so much. Thank you, JP. Can everybody hear me? All righty. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm thrilled to be here, um, especially sharing this with our MBA students um, and the broader community. Uh, a special shout out to my MBA Foundations of Finance class. Hi, if you're watching. And um, I'm gonna start my presentation by looking at the PowerPoint slides and I'll also take you through uh, a website I often use um, on, on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. So this is the topic of the session today. Uh, you all know we are almost fighting an invisible enemy. We don't know where, where this is. Um, and I'm very proud to be part of this lecture series as the inaugural presenter of this lecture series. So we'll uh, start off by looking at uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the US financial markets. If you especially see, uh, let me just uh, pull up my uh, pen. You see, this is where the trouble is right there in the last uh, six, week to, six weeks to eight weeks. Um, I updated this slide um, yesterday, but things have changed so drastically in the 24 hours. I find it hard to keep up. Um, so, um, so that is the impact on the U.S. financial markets. The next one I would like to share with you is uh, the worst performing industries for this year. 
where you can see it is blatantly obvious any uh, people facing business is struggling. You take the airlines, your retails, hotels, everything shutting down and sending the employees um, on um, leave, paid leave sometimes. So we'll get to that bit. Uh, give me one second. Let me go back to the previous slide and remove this. Um, that's better. So my... Um, uh, my pen has disappeared and my circle has disappeared. So that is where we are, specific industries. I wanted to also give you a global perspective. Um, you see, I have um, graphed out two graphs, uh, two time series. One is the S&P 500, which is in sort of an orange sort of a line. And light blue line is the MSCI World Market Index. So what you observe is they're tracking each other uh, all the way down to the bottom and rebounding off the bottom. And you notice that both markets have lost close to 24% in market capitalization. 24% uh, market capitalization translates to about five to six trillion for the S&P 500 companies that has been wiped off. U.S. markets being 25%, give or take, of the global equity markets, I would say we would have wiped off roughly 20 to 25 trillion globally in equities. So, um, but you will see a high correlation between the world index I have used, which is the MSCI world index, and the S&P 500 index, because S&P 500 is 25% of the global index. So it's no surprise to us. Uh, the next thing I would like to look at is a historical lesson going back in time. Uh, so I started my career at Stern in 2009. Uh, I've been working in the industry since 99. I know I'm dating myself, uh, but um, so I went through the dot-com bubble. I went through the um, financial crisis of 08, and here we are. Um, I wouldn't call this a recession, but some, an economic crisis. So what I wanted to point out to you all today is, um, give me one second, let me get my annotation right. And um, so this is the period I would like you all to look at where the global correlations amongst 20 largest equity markets in the world, um, they went uh, um, up together in tandem. So the average correlations for global equity markets are around um, uh, 55 to 60%. But during the financial crisis, it went up to close to 90% correlation. So you have taken your stats class, you have taken your fi uh, foundations class in finance and e economics. So you see there is nowhere to hide when the markets are highly correlated the way they were correlated in 2008. So the next thing I would like to show you is an updated uh, version of this correlation analysis. So let me undo that first and click back. Give me one second. I'm going to stop share. I'm going to a website, which I use often on a daily basis. So uh, JP, you can see this website. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you. So um, this is a famous web, uh, fa uh, website that is very famous uh, because it is created and founded by Professor Rob Engel. He's a Nobel laureate in economics in 2003. So I would really encourage you all to bookmark this welab.stern.nyu.edu site where he and his team, they update this site every day. So what I would like to show you is the volatility in the global markets going back 30 days. This is uh, up to the minute live site. So I'm going to just move my tracker to see when it's less red, the volatility is lower around the world. That is what it has been over the last 30 days. So I'm going to move this tracker close to today and you see how volatility has increased over this period of last 30 days. And here we are at time zero, even I can look forward 30, 30 years. Another thing I would like to share with you, which I focus because I'm an enthusiast of global equities, 
and this is my passion. So I would like to go and show you the updated current version of the correlation, which is very interesting, right? It is as of this morning, if you see the correlation, um, I would like you to focus on this number. That is the number we have to focus on. That is the average correlation. So this correlation is not up to uh, 2008 correlation, but pretty much there's nowhere to hide in the equity markets. And I would encourage you to look at a specific series of the correlation analysis Professor Engel puts out, which is this model, this uh, data set right here. So he won the Nobel Prize for Garch and Arch models. So that is his uh, passion. And he has created this time series using his expertise in the field over the last 35 years. So I would really encourage you to focus on that GR, just GJR time series, which is a Garch model. You can look up when you have time as to what Garch and Arch models mean. Um, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint um, presentation. So I wanted to share this live site with you. I would, be, I would really encourage you all to make use of this uh, slide in your career, in your day-to-day -day lives, and your investing uh, if you have an investment thesis. So I will stop sharing this uh, site, and I would go back to sharing uh, the PowerPoint slide where we left off. So I showed you the 2020 correlation. Pardon me, we shared um, So the next thing I would like you all to understand from a stats perspective is the difference between normal distribution and fat tail distribution. Let me illustrate as to what is the normal distribution and the fat tail um, uh, distribution. If I just borrow my pen one more time, So what you see here is, this is what I'm talking about. Um, so the tail events could be both positive, i.e. right tail events and left tail events. We are concerned about the left tail events. That is what this, uh, this uh, graph illustrates. So when you think about normal distribution, the, high, the probability of a highly unlikely event is next to nothing in normal distribution. Um, the financial markets and the financial models are based on normal distribution assumptions. What we learn in our portfolio theory, what we learn in Black Shaw's option pricing model, they are all based off normal distribution. So the issue with the normal distribution, or I would call it a challenge with normal distribution, is we underestimate the highly unlikely events, improbable events. But human behavior, emotions, animal spirits, that is what the human emotion that drives the markets, they tend to give us a distribution that is a fat tail. So if you think about the fat tail, I'm going to draw this. Um, let me see if I can find a different color to illustrate this. See, the highly likely, unlikely events happening of that is more than what we think or realize and we like to acknowledge, acknowledge in this real world. So that is the main takeaway from this fat tail distribution and the normal, um, normal distribution. Let me just undo. So I just wanted to give you the highlights of this normal distribution. So if you think about it, it's plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. We are saying 99%, almost 99.7% of the movements lie plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. So this is something we, very important for us to acknowledge here. So we are saying the probability of a highly improbable event is next to nothing. But in the real world, world the world, the market works, and the world events distribute sometimes can be fat tail distributions. So a three plus or minus three standard deviation events can happen more than what we think or we expect or model. So those are, the, um, those are the events I call the invisible losses, which we cannot model for. You can hedge against the tail event, but the hedging cost would be greater than what you might lose in a, 
uh, tail event. So people hesitate to hedge those events because they're very expensive to remove that um, tail events. So, so why is that important for us? I'll just give me, let me give you an example. Um, so we talk about, I wanted to uh, compare and contrast the Great Depression 2008 recession versus the COVID-19. So you see the flow of Great Depression. It lasted over 10 years, nearly 12 years from 1929. It's purely a financial problem. When you think about the Great Recession, the Great Recession did not start, in my humble opinion, in 2008. The foundations were laid back in the late 90s when we started repealing um, uh, regulation that prevented this excess and greed, especially the uh, Glass-Steagall Act in 1999 was repealed. So my, my uh, thesis on this is the financial crisis taught actually the foundations and the seeds were laid back in the late 90s and early 2000s through uh, financial regulation that led to this financial crisis. And the financial crisis in turn became a Main Street crisis. So you see that sequence of flow where it started as a financial deregulation, financial crisis to economics. But COVID-19 is a different issue. It's a global health crisis that impacts the Main Street. That leads on to a financial crisis and economic crisis we are facing today. So I would like you to distinguish what we are going through right now I know people and the finance, uh, financial press are talking about uh, recession and depression. I don't think that is, that is what it is, in my humble opinion. I don't want to sound like um, the mega church preacher on a Sunday, but I am optimistic that our economy would recover faster than people think. So let's look at the recoveries. I, I would like to uh, break the recoveries into two categories. The first category I would like to call is the economic recovery. People mistake the economy of the Main Street with the markets and the markets with the mainstream economy. That is completely incorrect. We were bound together 15, 20 years ago. Now, if you think about the S&P 500 companies, 45% of their revenues come from overseas. Therefore, S&P 500 index is reflecting the global economic growth rather than specific, specifically the economic activities in the United States. It's a key point a lot of practitioners tend to miss. So we'll decouple that and look at the economic recoveries. I went back nearly 100 years to look at the recession. I looked at, I'll just point this out to you. See the data source, and I would really encourage everybody to also bookmark the National Bureau of Economic Research website. A ton of data, a ton of information available for um, uh, practitioners like myself, academics, um, um, business students. So I would really encourage you to also bookmark this website. I'm not, I, I don't profit from this. I'm not plugging this. So what you note here is I went back to 2019, uh, 2019, nearly 100 years, and found that the average recession lasted for 18, uh, 15 months. In other words, what we're saying is the economic recovery begins after 15 months from the date of recession. It is marked by NBER, which is the National Bureau of Economic Research. But 2008 lasted 18 months, a bit longer because we had a, a deeper recession. So what, what you would like to note here is how much we lost in the index in 2008, 2009 period. We lost 50% of the market capitalization and it took us eight more years to go back to the peaks we reached in 2008. Eight more years, everyone. And sorry, that is the dot-com 
I'm very sorry, I'm talking about the dot-com bubble, which index lost 50% and took us eight years to go back to the uh, pre-recession peak. Um, apologies for that. 2008 crisis, we lost 55% and it took us three, six years to go back to the peak we reached in 2008. So let me just repeat myself and clarify myself. Dot-com bubble, we lost 55, 50%. And it took us eight years for recovery for S&P 500. 2008 financial crisis, index lost 55% and it took us six years to recover and reclaim the pre-recession highs. Okay? So what do you notice here is in the financial world, we call this the lost decade. Had you invested in S&P 500 in June of 2000 until 2012, you have made nothing out of those 12 years of investment. Of course, you received your dividends 2%, but the inflation was 2%. So on an inflation-adjusted basis, it had invested in 2000 to 2012, 100K would have remained to be 100K, just devalued after 12 years. So let's think about the COVID-19, what we are facing. I compare this to uh, blizzard. Blizzard doesn't last three months. So I would compare this to what happened during Hurricane Katrina and how long the recovery process took. I would like you to think about this from a national level. Think about Hurricane Katrina impacting the entire United States. So that is the way I would like you to think about the COVID-19. And in my humble opinion, I don't think it's prudent for us to associate COVID-19 with previous recessions and depressions because it's a, it's a forced shutdown of the economy. It is not because of greed. It is not because of excess. It is a forced shutdown to invest in the health of the Americans. That is what it is. So please do not misconstrue this to be a recession or a depression. So let's look at the numbers. What, what is the impact on the GDP? So let's take our GDP approximately about $21 trillion. So I know it, I shouldn't divide this by uh, four and say it's the quarter GDP, but let me make an assumption, a crude approximation of around $5 trillion per quarter. So according to the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of St. Louis, it's one of the regional feds. We have 12 of those in, in addition to the Federal Reserve, uh, where it is chaired by Jay Powell, there would be a 50% reduction in economic activity. So that translates to roughly 2.5 trillion over quarter three, a quarter two. That is what we are ent entering in, uh, on April 1st. And guess what? The stimulus package, the physical, re uh, physical response by the United States government is $2 trillion. So it's pretty much filling that gap and keeping our economy uh, run for the next three months. And I would also like to highlight to you that the global response is roughly, roughly 8 to 12% of the country-specific GDP, country-specific GDP. That's what I would like you. So you think about it, our 2 trillion is roughly between 10 and 12% um, of our GDP. So this is the global response. So your country's economy is a trillion, a 10% or 12% of that is being put into the economy uh, back by the government's respective governments. So let's talk about um, the process um, of uh, what is the labor market. If you think about the labor market activities in the United States, roughly 160 million people are employed. Out of that, what we categorize as the low risk category, knowledge workers, like yourself, myself, who are working, we have, what has happened is I have learned and discovered my ability to work remotely and I feel this is the dress rehearsal for future of work in the age of artificial intelligence, right? Everybody has figured out how to efficiently work remotely through this exercise. That is the only positive thing that came out of this um, disastrous event. 
So what do you notice here is um, 54% is up uh, the knowledge category. I'm being biased. I'm calling us and you as the um, knowledge workers here. So, and the average salary in the United States um, is for the low risk uh, category workers is roughly 64,000. It doesn't reflect a doctor's salary, but this is the overall average for low risk categories. We have something where uh, the job losses would be substantial in the high risk category in the United States. The um, salaries, and annual salaries for that group uh, is about $36,000 per, per year. And I also looked at more deeply into the high risk category. What I've found is um, about 27 million or 16% of 164 million in the workforce are in ultra high risk category. That's where the substantial layoffs and unemployment is bound to happen. So let me just repeat myself. Low risk category 54, 46% is high risk category. And then I drilled deeper into the high risk category and I found about 16% of the 164 million workforce are in very great risk of losing the jobs. So, but that is not to scare, but I scare everybody or anybody. I wanted to put the facts out there and be real about it. We need to know what we are facing. Therefore, we can overcome this uh, quickly, rather quickly. I'm just clearing my screen so that it'll be cleaner when we move to the next uh, slide. So what is the fiscal response by the United States government? You would have heard about the 2.2 trillion of funding that is available to the US economy. The highlights are, are direct payments to the household. You know, the $1,200 check if you're earning below 75,000. Unemployment insurance has been extended from 26 weeks to 39 weeks, right? So the idea here is, remember the average salary of the high risk group is 36,000. The government of the United States is trying to replace roughly 70% of the income so that if they have something known as a moral cushion, moral cushion so that they will have enough money to buy their groceries, do their daily shopping, take care of the kids, put food on the table, which is very important for us, for, for us to have a speedy recovery to the economy. Everybody has to be healthy. This is a health crisis. We have to take care of each other and the American citizens so that we can be back to work as soon as possible. Uh, we all know the tax deadline has been extended until July. Small business loans have been substantial to backstop the small loans. So aids the states, uh, depending on the population, uh, a sort of a mini airline bailout, which is roughly $30 billion. So those are the highlights coming out of the two trillion uh, fiscal policy response from the government. So the next thing I would like to look at is the uh, monetary, give me one second the monetary uh, pos uh, policy response by the Federal Reserve, which is what we are learning in our classes. So the race to the bottom, cutting the interest rates to zero, uh, quantitative easing, buy buying back assets, uh, uh, companies that might be issuing bonds and commercial papers, nobody's out there to buy. Federal Reserve would step in to buy them. That is the quantitative easing. This is the fourth round since financial crisis. I want you all to pay key um, uh, uh, I would like you all to focus on this Emergency Lending Act, uh, Federal Reserve 13-3 uh, power. That says the short-term money market and short-term borrowing will be taken care of, will be funded by the commercial paper funding facility, which comes under the Emergency 13-3 Act of the Federal Reserve, which is very important for us because in 2008, this market froze and it led to a lot of financial crisis and it, it created a lot of chaos in the marketplace. We want to avoid that. But my opinion on this, monetary policy response, it will not take effect until Q3. 
you can give us any amount of money you want to, but if you don't want to go out and spend the money, there's no way the economy would kickstart again. So the monetary policy response would kick in in Q3 when the isolation and the lockdowns are minimized or completely removed. That is what you have to focus on. JP, how am I doing for time? You've got a few more minutes if you want. Yes, please. I have a couple of more slides. That's it. Go for it. Babe. Thank you, JP. So what I would like to summarize, these are my observations, and this is my opinion only. So I looked at the banking system over the last 12 years. We seem healthier than ever before compared to 2008. I would even go on to argue that we are substantially better. But for our economy to recover, put people back to work, my opinion is the country has to go through a complete lockdown between six to eight weeks. I believe that will avoid or minimize the second wave of the COVID-19 possibly in fall, that will be eliminated if we go through this uh, lockdown process. And it will also kickstart our economy faster. It's like an athlete who has broken or injured their, uh, their knees. They have to go through rehabilitation before they start running again or playing tennis. Therefore, we have to take care of our health first and the economy will be back on track. That's my humble opinion. So Q3 and Q4 will have some sort of a transition to the normalcy we have experienced. Going out, enjoying the restaurants, the employment is back. And so economic activities are back. So my prediction is for growth to return, it will be Q2 of 2021. 2021 is when I'm expecting that we'll come, come out of this lull. So you all are worried broadly. We are, I know we have a town hall next on employment opportunities. My humble request to you is to just hunger down for the next eight to 12 weeks. We will be fine in Q3 and everybody will be happy then. So this is where I will finish my uh, presentation today. I truly, truly appreciate your time here and thank you, many thanks to JP and uh, Dean Paula. Thank you all. Thank you, Haran. Thanks. Uh, so I've got some great questions that came in between the Q&A and the chat that, that I'd love to kind of throw out here for you. And I'll try and as there are more are coming in, I'll try to kind of moderate a little bit as well. Let me start with this. Um, specifically, how long of a shutdown do you think we would have to have for, we, for us to go into a full-on recession? Like how long would this, would, would this kind of self-quarantine or kind of uh, social distancing kind of have to, have to run for it to affect, it, affect things in that way? Uh, if this shutdown, complete shutdown, not, I'm not talking about uh, partial shutdown, if it prolongs for more than three months, that will lead us on to, in, on to a so-called recession. But I would not classify this COVID event as a recession or a depression. Okay. Uh, second, um, thinking about kind of the impact globally and kind of the interdependence among the, the different countries in the world, it feels like given that this, this initially out, uh, the outbreak started in China and China is obviously so important for global supply chains, we were going to be feeling some significant impact of this, even if it never left the Wuhan province in China in all likelihood, right? I mean, so- Correct. Absolutely right. And, and so, uh, it, you know, do you, do you view, like, how, how, much should, how much should we be thinking about of what's going on in this country is driven by kind of shutdowns and supply chains that are kind of global versus sh shutdowns on Main Street and things like that that are much more local to our, our own economic environment? Can, is there a way to disentangle them or not really? It is very difficult to do that, but we would feel a lag effect of the supply chain by between six and eight weeks. So in every term, we, have, we are behind the curve of China, Wuhan province, by give or take 10 to 12 weeks. Okay. So, so to some extent, that would almost kind of suggest that us shutting things down here in New York City and things uh, and the kind of 
lagged impact of shut, shutdowns in China almost showed up at the same time in the sense of, you know, two and a half months or so after kind of some of the initial major outbreaks in China and things like that. I, I concur, completely concur with that. Okay. Um, there were a couple different flavors of questions that came in about some of the long-term implications of this. And I think specifically the two main things that came up were thinking about uh, the actions by the Federal Reserve and thinking about the overall debt debt levels that are kind of going on here. I think a lot of our younger, younger students, a little bit younger than you and I, who uh, maybe are, are, are looking a little farther in the future, are worried about- Substantially younger, JP. So I, I was trying to be nice to both of us, right? But, but still- Substantially younger than us. You're absolutely right. So, so what do you think about these things? I am, How much I am should, not worried. Should, you know, 28 year olds be concerned about these issues? I would not be worried, not because I'm not 28. Uh, deficit spending should be done now. We have to go big. 2.5 trillion is not sufficient. We need more relief to the economy. If everybody is healthier, we will get back on our feet faster. We had immense deficit spending during World War II. We inflated our way out of it. We can do that again. We are borrowing money for nothing. In real terms, inflation adjusted. Therefore, please don't be worried about it. United States has done it before. We will get out of it as we have done it before. Okay. Um, trying to kind of go through a bunch of these other questions that have been, been coming in here. So um, if maybe I'll start to transition to some things that are maybe a little more uh, things that people might want to know about for their personal stock portfolios and things like that. Um, right. Maybe I'll start with that one. What should people do? Like, should people be looking at, you know, uh, you know, like people, some people tell you that, that, that you should be just not even paying any attention to it and you just ride it out. Some people are saying there's an opportunity to buy. Some people are telling you to hide your, ma your money in a mattress. What should people do? Um, and obviously there's a common good problem here. It's like if everyone pulls their money out, then obviously we know what, what will happen. But if you're going to advise an individual person, what would your recommendation be for someone right now? Doing nothing is the best course of action. My Why? Personal, Go ahead. We will recover through this crisis and the markets would rebound. I haven't looked at my statements, my individual statements or 401k statements in six weeks. I haven't bought a single security. I haven't sold a single security. My, my humble request to you is, do not look at your 401k, Roth IRA, IRA statements until end of June. Just turn a blind eye towards it. If you are contributing towards 401k, continue to do it. Don't increase the allocation, don't reduce the allocation. Just pretend nothing happened in terms of your portfolios. Okay, that's a bold statement. One, one more, one more if, I, if you don't mind, JP. Mr. Buffett has lost 50% of his portfolio four times in his career. That is how he's worth $80 billion. Stay the course. We have to be in it for the long term. Okay. If we're thinking about uh, potential, potential moments when it would be the right time to buy and jump in, what are some of the maybe the, the growth indicators or kind of what, what, what kind of things should people be looking for in order to kind of track when, when we should expect to start seeing things moving up? What are kind of those, those leading indicators we should see the three, COVID, six, nine months the, down the road? The COVID numbers, infectious cases, numbers have to start going down. Number of deaths in the United States start to go down. That is the, that is the indication that everything will be recovering. So it is a health, health and a virus-driven recovery, not through any economic indicators. Okay. Um, the follow-up question on, on the comment about kind of the overall, uh, not looking at your, at your 401k or, or whatever, whatever it is that you may have, uh, aren't there certain companies, sectors that might be more affected by this even long-term to some extent? Or should we be selling you know, cruise industry stocks or things like that? Or, or is this kind of a blanket statement you would say? I would say it's a blanket statement. 99% of us, including myself, this is not relevant. If you are in, invested in a broad index portfolio, stay with it. We are not stock pickers. Unfortunately, I do it, but 98% of us don't do this. So 
unless you have a small portfolio, you can afford to lose the money, maybe 5,000, 10,000, then you can pick the industries that have been beaten down. But be cautious about it, very cautious about it. Okay. Uh, are, there, are there things like the significant decline in oil prices that we're kind of seeing that, are other, that may have other ripple effects on the economy that we should be paying attention to, attention to? Or is this, I mean, again, back to your statement that your leading indicator is going to be the number of COVID-19 infections. Is this really simply about a health thing and you expect all different aspects to rebound? Oil industry is different. It's an artificial um, fight between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Therefore, oil industry plays by different rules. It is not mainly due to the COVID-19. It's the Saudi, Russia, some sort of a friendly fight. That is what leading to it. But they will come to their senses and they'll cut back on supply. It's a different ball game. Okay. Um, so uh, one question that just came in, thinking about this investment, and then I'll go back to kind of one broader topic here. Comment about saying, I understand staying the course on what you've already invested, but for those who may actually be getting bonuses, bonus checks, I, I would like to know what, what employers you're working for that are giving bonus checks right now. But still, uh, <laughs> if you're getting a bonus check or you found a pile of money under your mattress, should you be buying now? Should you buy in, in two weeks? Should you be buying in a month? Like what, what, would, your, what would your guidance, your best guess be when, when we're, we're going to hit bottom? Nobody has ever picked the bottom right. Market timing is the most dangerous game. I'm talking from my experience. Therefore, please set a set amount and a monthly amount to invest. You can start tomorrow, but don't go in 100%. Bet your toes. If you have $1,000, invest $50 and progressively start doing it. Picking the market bottoms is a fool's errand. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of offer a note on that, which is basically the a uh, lot of research looking at the idea that the the people who actually get the really rare, uh, kind of almost impossible to predict things right, because someone's always going to get it right in some way, shape, or Correct. form, usually aren't doing so from a, from a, a place of kind of deeper knowledge. It's just someone's going to get it right. Someone's going to actually you know find that bottom. We then laud them as being brilliant afterwards because they were the ones that got it, but there was no real reason that they were able to nail that right. JP, 100% right. So uh, I think there was a couple other ones. So the broader perspective that kind of came in through a couple different questions was thinking about whether we want to call it Main Street, small and medium enterprises. Um, a lot of this has been talking about kind of individual families and, and consumer purchases, as well as airlines, big companies and things like that. I know there's this small business loan and kind of and, and grant portion of the, the package, but what, what should we be looking for as far as impact on kind of smaller companies versus larger companies? How do you see that playing out over the course of the next year plus? Uh, stronger, um, large companies with stronger balance sheets are going to benefit from this uh, COVID-19. I'm very sad and sorry to share that several small businesses would never recover. They will never come back online. So we are going to have uh, a small amount of bankruptcies, but the general economy would recover. Uh, on, that, on that note, do you expect that when some of these, I mean, so small businesses going bankrupt is a pretty normal aspect of the economy and clearly it, may, it will go up in this situation. But in many cases, they're replaced by new small businesses that look to kind of capitalize on a different opportunity in that same space. Do you expect that we're going to see more big companies Companies taking the place of small companies, or will we still see that kind of wave of new small companies coming in here? Unfortunately, large companies like Amazon and Google are going to benefit once that demand is taken over by Amazon and Co. We are not going to see many uh, small businesses coming to replace the small businesses. I think, to some extent, at least in my perspective, it really becomes around a question of whose money jumps in first when there's new opportunity that comes in. And I think, in many cases, the ability to spend money of an Amazon or an Apple or a Google is going to outstrip what might come through bank lending, private equity, venture, even venture capital money in some ways. So I, I would tend to agree, un unfortunately, kind of pessimistically with that with that view. Um, unfortunately, JP. Yeah, I'm thinking about kind of, you know, what may happen to the restaurant scene just around NYU, just to be kind of very local for a second. We might expect to see more chain restaurants 
starting to come not, in when, not when we start seeing kind of things opening up again to replace many of the smaller ones that make uh, it is a possibility but i would think not around stern um, but smaller businesses in uh, middle part of america is, are gone they're never coming back yeah is there anything you can think of that the government should be doing to try and save those businesses that's that would be a, a, a the right kind of approach to take or or is this kind of inevitable right now unfortunately it's inevitable um, okay. my hope is the current uh, liquidity crisis for small and medium sized businesses don't turn into a bankruptcy or a solvency crisis hopefully the government can backstop them for the next 3 months with the loans so that they can survive and thrive okay and so maybe uh maybe I'll kind of try to move towards ending on, on with this one so uh policy makers or business managers uh how should we be trying to prevent a corporate liquidity crisis like this in the future what are the things that we should be doing again either from a policy point of view or if you're the manager of a of a small medium enterprise or even a larger one going forward what would you recommend that we should be doing unfortunately we have to deal with it when it happens um we don't have deep pockets forever unfortunately we have limited resources the companies cannot plan for the liquidity event uh, let me give you an example of a restaurant industry they have two weeks of cash buffer if they don't have business for two weeks they have to shut down so nobody works with the cash buffer unless you're apple microsoft google or facebook therefore the policy makers cannot have anything in place right now for a crisis that might happen 10 years down the track we cannot treat an injury but the injury happens I mean, you know one argument you could make would be that you should right right i mean the question should be i mean one one way to think about it is should we be requiring businesses to keep a larger cash buffer and what would be the implications of doing so i guess it'd be hard for some of these businesses to even survive in the first place if they had to have 5 6 weeks of cash lying around absolutely right jp but would that would that weed out just the bad organizations so that we would actually you know that might kill off the bad ones faster if they had to have a certain amount of cash on hand and like is that even a reasonable policy to even think about or, or again should we just not even be worrying about it and treat it like I it wouldn't be worrying about that holding on to cash for 6 weeks um, cash it doesn't earn enough returns on them so it should be invested in the business activities i wouldn't recommend that okay I would assume though you might feel differently about some businesses that maybe back to kind of the 2008 financial crisis kind of too big to fail kind of organizations who maybe maybe should be forced to kind of maintain liquidity somewhat differently than a restaurant. We have substantially improved with that scene. So uh, the government has put pl- uh, regulation into uh, place where the limits wouldn't happen again hopefully. So um, Okay. Nick asked a great question in the Q&A that I was looking at here. You you talked a Nick lot about Foon. Sorry, Nick Fo- Nick Foster? Oh, Nick Foster, one of my favorite students. You you know, you said that about a lot of Oh, sorry. No, no. I'm sure. Ned, sorry. <laughs> um, but Nick asked a great question here because you 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 were talking earlier about how the um the covid-19 infection rate mortality rate hospitalization rates whatever it is would be one of the the important indicators in this case. Um are there concerns do you have any concerns about the fact that some of that data is not always that transparent I mean we can think about the challenges early when China was maybe we don't really know but was not fully sharing data from that perspective and the problems in the US where the lack of testing makes makes our guess is that infections actually kind of a shot in the dark at this point in time it, it is uh, an issue that testing is an issue that we don't know the real numbers but as the testing capacity improves in the next 6 to 8 weeks we'll have a better grasp of the numbers and uh, we'll have a better idea as to what the true infection rates are. at least we can make a probability statement about what the true numbers are based on the sampling okay so sampling would be certainly a way to a way to try and to try and address that absolutely All right, and we're still got a couple minutes before one, so I'll go ahead and I we were never quite sure when we were supposed to end this thing, but uh, there's a couple of other questions in here um that I'll I'll go ahead and throw out here. Were valuations too high pre before this crisis, kind of similar to the 2001 internet bubble, um and therefore would should we expect that valuations may fall even farther as in kind of a response to that or do you think we were fairly valued this is a a shock and then we'll recover to that level? we will recover before the covid-19 uh, episode 
my year in target for S&P 500 was 3,200 to 3,400. So I was very, very optimistic about this year. It was about a six, seven, eight percent uh, returns from the markets because we returned 30 percent last year. Uh, I'm not 100 percent convinced we, we would reach the 3,400 by the end of the year, but the markets weren't exactly overvalued uh, prior to this episode. Okay. Um, and maybe, maybe because I'm an innovation person, uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I will end with this question um, that that came in here as well. Um, you know, uh, and Kaori raised this really nice point, kind of saying that during the last recession, kind of 08 uh, to 2010, there were a number of companies founded: Uber, Airbnb, Slack, Pinterest, Square, Venmo, things like that, that became kind of big aspects of the economy and kind of really reshaped the economy going forward. What kinds of businesses do you think will come out of this crisis that will, I mean, and don't give me Zoom. We are, Zoom already existed. We know that, right? But like, what, what else do you think is going to come out of here that you would be, be betting on that would be the, the, the big response, the big outcomes of this crisis 10 years from now? Uh, biotech industry. Finding cures for these um, uh, viruses, unknown viruses, coming up with vaccines faster. It takes about a year and a half right now. We can uh, shorten it to 12 months. So that is, I'm very, uh, very optimistic about it. So anything to do with pandemic prevention, because governments are going to pour money into this in the next few years. If we spend hundred billion today, we don't have to write a check for $2 trillion in 10 years. Um, um, Korea learned this from SARS. They were better prepared. Um, Zika, Ebola, other countries were better prepared. We didn't have such a e- e- um, pandemic in the United States in a long time. So this is for the time for us to invest into healthcare and anything to do with the antiviral drugs or vaccines, biotech technology uh, would be the innovative place, I believe. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and close this first session of kind of uh, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on kind of different aspects of the, U- of the U.S. and the, kind of the global economy. Um, I know everybody can't actually do, do this because of the way we set this room up, but a huge virtual applause for Professor Seagram for um, kind of volunteering to take the time and talk with all of us uh, about, about his perspective on these things. I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did as well. Um, We will be in communication with everyone on future events in this series, hopefully coming up soon. But again, a huge thanks to Professor Seagram for for being our guinea pig and doing this. Huge thanks to Paula Goldfarb and team for kind of helping set this up. And as always, huge thanks to the IT team that makes all of this stuff possible in a world where we're all sitting in our bedrooms, living rooms, uh, basements, whatever it might be. Um, But again, it was great to talk with you, Haran. Thanks so much for doing this. And uh, Thank you, JP. Look forward to coming with everyone again soon. See you all. Thank you for taking your time.